about what I use a bank account for most days, it's two things. It's one, it's a place to store my money. Mm -hmm. So that when I get my paycheck from Medici, I'm not taking home a wad of cash and putting it in my sock drawer or a mm -hmm. safe in my basement. Right. Two, it's access to digital currency. Mm -hmm. So then when I go to the store, you know, if I go to Costco on the weekend with my wife, I don't have to take a gangster wad of cash <laughs> to pay for it all. Right. Well, for me, digital currency is a credit card or a debit card. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a bank, you don't have either one of those. A digital wallet serves both those purposes. Mm -hmm. A place to store money digitally and a way to spend it digitally. So Bit has worked with retailers, mm -hmm. gas stations, grocery stores, uh, you know, uh, uh, restaurants throughout Barbados to take the M money currency that you can buy in your digital wallet. Mm -hmm. It lets then people uh, store currency, they don't need a bank account, and spend it. And the government of Barbados recently announced that they're doing a pilot program where you'll be able to pay your bills, your government bills, and you'll be able to receive government funds via this. Through BIT? Through BIT. Wow. The other thing BIT's doing, and we think it's really exciting, is that helping central banks in the Caribbean issue some of their currency digitally, mm. cut down on uh, the cost of printing money, right. uh, send the money out digitally, uh, cut those costs. So we think those two things together really have a symbiotic effect because people will get money, they'll want to spend money, mm -hmm. merchants will want to take it, the government will be issuing money that way. We think it's got a lot of promise. And it solves a problem. This vast number of people that are unbanked can now all of a sudden jump to the 21st century economy. If you don't have a bank account and you want to pay your electricity bill, what do you do? Well, you can't write a check. You can't pay with a credit card. You gotta take time off work, walk down to the utility company, stand in line and yeah. pay in cash. That's true, that's Stop true. Stop that. Yeah. That really puts a ceiling on how fast people can progress. So it's interesting, is it sort of like the fax machine? You know, as soon as there's enough other people who have them, then suddenly you know, it explodes? There's absolutely a network effect to yeah. this, right? Yeah. If everyone has a wallet and their money on it, but no merchant takes it, what good is it? Right. All merchants take it, but no one has a wallet. You need this network effect, and then it just spins up really quickly. Right. And the fact that the Barbados government is doing a pilot program at the government level, mm -hmm. we think is like everybody getting fax machines. Yeah, it sounds like it would go that way. All right, so now you guys are excited about uh, digital wallets. What else do you see? You know, the digital wallet one is interesting because it requires a network effect. Mm -hmm. Let me talk about one that doesn't require a network effect, but I think has great use. We've got a portfolio company in the Bay Area called Pier Nova. Mm -hmm. They're using blockchain to monitor back office transactions at banks. Mm -hmm. So every transaction that goes into the system uh, gets put on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. This is a mutable record. Why would a bank want that? Well, one reason is their compliance burdens mm -hmm. are enormous. They've got armies of compliance officers and armies of people auditing the compliance officers right. and making sure the databases they have don't get hacked or don't get tweaked you know, in a non-compliant way. Put that all on the blockchain, the compliance and the audit almost goes away. Mm -hmm. And so there are banks that are looking at Piranova and are, are in proof of concepts with this project where if one bank uses it, it cuts out an enormous amount of cost for that bank. It doesn't matter if 10 other banks use it. It's, it's a blockchain case that's really valuable that doesn't require a network effect. Are there, are there complications with that relative to like banking regulations where, you know, well, you have to audit and you got to audit the auditors basically, where now they're saying, hey, we're going around this. We got technology to get rid of all these people. Uh, is there, is there going to have to be some changing in banking regulation? I think, that, I think it's going to play right into the current regulations mm -hmm. because it creates an immutable audit trail. Mm -hmm. The reason we have all these compliant audit, compliance officers is to, because the audit is hard to prove. If you can put a query on something that the regulators know is unchangeable. So the technology is just more efficient compliance. The, as, more efficient compliance. Right. It's a great system. 
Well, that, that's, uh, I mean, you know, to me, this conjures up like you're only limited by your imagination on blockchain because you start to look at all these different applications, oh, it can go anywhere. It's all over the place. Yeah. Let me talk about one word. One of our portfolio companies, Factum, is doing with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Mm -hmm. So the Gates Foundation does great work in Africa, mm -hmm. and they're trying to uh, solve health problems mm -hmm. there. Um, in South Africa, very mobile population, mm -hmm. uh, 12, you know, lots of languages are spoken mm -hmm. there. As the population moves, they frequently are getting tested for uh, different viral problems. Mm -hmm. They go to the doctor this time, they get treated for it, they move, they go to a new doctor. There's no history of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Language is a barrier. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said, we gotta figure out how to fix this. And so they're using Factum to put people's medical records on the blockchain. Well, that was gonna be one of my questions uh, because uh, you know, my background is in healthcare. So mm -hmm. looking at, I said, the implications of the electronic health record in blockchain, um, and being able to have multiple providers anywhere in labs and, you know, et cetera, all say, here's, here's where it's controlled, it, it is secured, et cetera. Because I know Google took a run at this, Microsoft took a run at this, never quite got there as far as like a repository for electronic health records. But this could just leapfrog it, it all. This could do it, and it's bio, you can have it with biometrically secure. So mm -hmm. I'm a South African, I've been tested in one city, I've been treated in one city, my records are all on this blockchain record. I move, I use my biometrics to access my health data, mm -hmm. show it to my new doctor. She sees what my past tests were, what my past drugs were, what those dosages were. She can now make a much more educated diagnosis and dosage for me right. because of blockchain technology. It's really awesome. I mean, it really is awesome. Do you see now also sort of a, uh, an interaction or merger of what used to be like um, industries that were in silos uh, where like you, know, you got power, you got, you know, you've got uh, healthcare, you've got, you know, all these different uh, types of, you know, uh, banking, you know. So now is there going to be some sort of integration now because of blockchain or do you think they all kind of still stay, stay as separate? industries? That's a big hard question. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I think one of the things that blockchain and particularly cryptocurrency lets happen among industries is it helps share information mm -hmm. more quickly. And sometimes people want to monetize information, but it's not worth the cost of a payment, a big payment, either a credit card or an ACH banking payment. But Cryptocurrency lets us do micropayments. Mm -hmm. So if you have an Internet of Things application that's saying, here's the weather, mm -hmm. I can give you all this weather data. As a farmer, I pull that data down, I make micropayments on that. It then, you know, my, my smart sprinkler system then shows me how I adjust my watering pattern. Mm -hmm. All of that can have blockchain aspects in in sharing the data and paying for the data. I do think it brings the Internet of Things, you know, this mass data becomes more real and more usable. That's interesting because, you know, the Internet of Things is exploding mm. right now. I mean, exponentially, there's just more and more things coming online and being connected. So, uh, and there's probably some sense of autonomy that people want where they don't want people in the middle kind of uh, brokering information. Might there be social networks uh, that, that start to go to blockchain? You know, because right now, I know that when I'm on Facebook or I'm searching on Google, I'm being monetized by those companies, you know, because they're, they've got my data. Is there, they're sort of middlemen also, aren't they? They're, they're absolutely middlemen. And we recently announced an investment in a social media company. Oh, really? We're using okay. a blockchain okay. called Minds, M-I-N-D-S. And what they're doing is using a token economy to boost up posts so people create uh, content and they're not asking for advertising. I mean, the reason Facebook and, and a lot of social media companies work is they've got advertising paying for everything that's right. for free. Minds is using tokenization and blockchain technology to try and create a freer, controlled system where, controlled meaning self-sovereign, right. you're not giving all your data uh, to minds 
so that they can then sell it off to others. I think that's a big deal. Uh, you know, a we, hope so. big deal. Yeah. we hope so. We hope so. Because I know that I, I think on the consumer side, there's a lot of angst about, you know, especially after Cambridge Analytica and you know some of the stuff that's come down the pike. And certainly, there's a lot of concerns about Google and, and the way they're you know uh, farming data and, and utilizing it. To say that hmm, we can get rid of these middle these companies in the middle of our data and the people we're communicating with and start to have a, a blockchain. Uh, process to be able to have this connection with other people, that's that's pretty spectacular. And it goes back to what I said. One of our primary goals is to help rehumanize commerce. Yeah. You know, when when you first hear that, you go, "That's audacious. That's yeah. ridiculous." We really think it has the ability for people to interact one on one without all these middlemen, and that's meaningful. Well, I mean, it goes all the way full circle to your original metaphor. What is more human than the handshake? Right. I mean, you know, what other species does that? But the handshake, there's a, there's a spiritual dimension to mm -hmm. it that now, you know, sort of is, you know, uh, modernized through this blockchain uh, context. I'm very fascinating. You know, a lot of people refer to blockchain as trustless technology. Mm -hmm. That's not a term I like. Yeah. I like trust through technology. Right. Because this... Trust, I think, is the spiritual aspect of a, a handshake. It shows we trust each other, we touch each other, right. we, we squeeze each other, we're focused together. Technology, of block, blockchain technology, lets us trust each other digitally.